and that I did it and I did it more I did more than I planned you know you know when I left on this trip I thought it would be maybe six months to get from Paris to Cape Town you know that trip alone was 16 months and then I moved from Nairobi to England so I ended up being gone what I thought was gonna be a six month trip turned into 22 years <laughs> <laughs> hello I'm Alan Hill in this podcast series of the nostalgic vagabond we're talking travel all kinds of travel, with all kinds of interesting people from all around the world. In conversation, we'll share personal anecdotes, tales of adventure, and maybe misadventure too. Listen in for some unique cultural perspectives, tips from seasoned veterans, and an array of diverse experiences that have contributed to many life-changing journeys. Travel really is a privilege. We know that now. And if we can't do it right this very moment, let's talk about it then. Hey, where are you right now? On this episode of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast, I talk with Tamara B. Tamara is a Canadian-British traveller with three decades of adventures and experiences. Life changed for Tamara in 1993 when an old school friend convinced her to pack up everything and go on an ambitious overland journey across multiple continents from Paris to Cape Town in South Africa. We'll touch on this a bit but focus as well on Tamara's return leg, where she hitchhiked back up the coast from South Africa to Nairobi in Kenya, solo. In conversation, Tamara reveals that it really all began when she moved from her home province of Ontario, out west to Banff, to work in hospitality. But it didn't take too much convincing from schoolmate Casey to take on this epic overland journey, which was supposed to take about six months, but it was basically a year and then some. Tamara explains why she decided to hitchhike back up to Kenya, and she reflects on that time she was lost in Lesotho, was propositioned by a guy like Richard Gere did to Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman, and details her crazy ordeals in Mozambique. Tamara has extensive experience travelling through Africa in the 90s, and she's had the Malawi to prove it. This trip was life-changing, and Tamara tells of some of the most important lessons she learned on this crazy odyssey. Anyways, let's get to the conversation. Tamara B, thanks for coming on the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. <laughs> Where are you right now? Well, I'm in lockdown in Ontario, Canada. <laughs> so just outside oh, wow. of Toronto. Yeah, I've been looking forward to having you on this podcast for a long time because you've got so much experience traveling and independently traveling, solo traveling, and all over the world. So I've been really looking forward to having a chat. We only have about one hour. We could probably chat for days and days. You have so many stories. But we only have one hour. You've also got your own website, which is manyroadstraveled.com. And for American English spellers, that's traveled with two L's instead of one, right? That is right. It's spelled properly. <laughs> <laughs> so even though we'll only have a short amount of time today on this podcast, listeners can find you at that website and can listen to many, many more stories you have from your, what is it, three decades of travel? That's right. Yep. Yep. From my website, you can obviously get to the blog, uh, my YouTube channels, my vlog and my travel podcast. Brilliant. So let's get stuck into it then, eh? Tamara, you are an avid traveler, an entrepreneur, I guess a creator as well now that you're doing digital creations with websites and vlogging, etc. You also have been traveling since your early 20s. On this particular podcast, I wanted to talk about some of your experiences hitchhiking and more specifically hitchhiking in Africa, which to me seems kind of mental, but <laughs> hitchhiking in the 90s in Africa I mean, I was in year five doing mathematics with Mr. Luscombe and yelling out stupid things across the classroom, throwing pens at my, 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 my colleagues. Um, <laughs> 90s travel in Africa is, is something I find extremely adventurous, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about that today. But before we get to a particular journey that I wanted to focus on, which is your solo hitchhiking from South Africa to Kenya... I wanted just to get a little bit of background from you on where you were in your life when you were 23. You were 
embarking on these massive adventures that were going to take you through Europe and through Africa. I, I've, I've spoken to you before, and, and I know that you obviously didn't start in South Africa. There was a journey in getting there first. Can you just explain a little bit about what you were doing at the age of 23 and then quickly how you ended up being in South Africa? And then we'll talk about your hitchhiking experiences from there. Well, I did do a few trips in my teens, actually late teens, but they were just like to Colombia and Mexico. Mm. So, uh, but when I was 21, I, I, I did two years of university in Toronto and then I, I took a year out and I decided that I was just going to move to the other side of the country. Really, Now, Canada is so huge. So it's, you know, you're going through about three different time zones, I think, or two at least. Yeah, so I decided I wanted to go to the Rocky Mountains for a while. Well, I don't even know how long, but my dad was an avid skier and I came home and just kind of looked through his ski brochures and picked out a couple of hotels that looked nice and sent my CV, my resume off to them and got a job. And so moved to Banff, Alberta. Yeah, I just turned 21 and ended up living out there for a year by myself. Well, like I went by myself, but, uh, you know, I had a job and residence and everything like that. So after that year, I came back to London, Ontario. So I call it Little London, <laughs> which is where I am now. I, I thought, okay, I want, I love that. I love, you know, doing, even though it was in my own country, you know, it was, it's kind of sparked the adventure, even though the little trips I did before kind of did that too. So my plan was to just work my butt off and save money. And I didn't know if it existed or not, but I wanted to go to the Caribbean and yacht hitch <laughs> <laughs> or yacht hike or hitchhike, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So that was my plan. I, I was, you know, it saved up quite a lot of money and it was in about the autumn of 1992 and I was bartending in two jobs and a friend of mine came in who I hadn't seen since high school. So I hadn't seen him for about four years. His, mm. his, his name's Casey. And so we were chatting and, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm taking some time out, too, from university. And my plan is I want to go from Paris to Cape Town by land. You should mm -hmm. come with me. And I went, no, because that sounds bloody crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with the yachts of the Caribbean. Thanks. And anyways, he was like, well, let's just meet up next week for lunch and catch up. Right. I'm like, OK. So, of course, we did that. He was still on the hard sell. And he's like, listen, just borrow this book. I think. It was the only real guidebook for Africa at the time by Lonely Planet called Africa on a Shoestring. And it was like thick. It was probably about three inches thick easily. <laughs> He's like, just borrow this and just read it. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Just to shut him up. I took it. <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm like, whoa, wow, it does sound really cool. <laughs> so about two weeks later, I call him back. I was like, right, when are we leaving? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, I was planning on leaving in December. I was like, well, okay, well, I, I won't have enough money and get everything organized until probably mid-January. He's like, okay, I'll wait. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we left January 17th, 1993, for, you know, flew from Toronto to Paris. I stupidly thought that, he, you know, he might be a bit organized and know where or even have guidebooks for Europe and the Middle East or at least know where we're going to stay in Paris. No, he did not. <laughs> so it was literally, <laughs> we just winged it. And it, we're in January, so it was off season. You know, this is before the internet, before Facebook, for mobile phones, everything, right? You know, no trip advisor back then. So, mm. so we'd even know areas, because many places there are areas that have cheap accommodation, you know, and they usually kind of stick together. But no, we had no clue what we were doing. And like I said, in the winter, so it was, it was cold in Europe and my backpack weighed about I don't know, 21, 22 kilos when I, when I left. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, you know, we had to have clothes, you know, for cold temperatures, for hot temperatures. Uh, I, I had a tent, sleeping bag, the, you know, the whole shebang kind of thing. So, yeah. So January 17th, 93 was the start of the trip. Yeah. So you and Casey together and uh, started in Paris your goal was to head all the way through Africa yep so the goal and was to go from Paris to Cape Town by land or water like just no flying basically so it was a massive mission and this is my first backpacking trip right and like I said I yeah. just turned 23 
really no clue what we're doing. <laughs> well, neither did he. It was his first trip as well. So for like rookie trips. It's insane. We started at the top. <laughs> You uh, you dived into the deep end, let's say. Well, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to this so, day, it was my longest, hardest, maybe most rewarding trip I've ever done, like in the 30 years. Yeah. So you and Casey started in Paris and you went through Europe into Africa. At some point, Casey left you on your own. What was that all about? Well, it wasn't like so... Yeah, it took us about seven weeks to get to Africa. So we went through like France, Italy, Greece, a few islands into Turkey, and then uh, Syria and Jordan into Egypt that way. Mm. Um, and then by the time we got to Kenya, it had been about five, just over, yeah, about five and a half months that we were traveling together. And that is a long time spending 24 seven with someone especially someone you hadn't really seen for four years no doubt so I mean for the most part we got along really well because we were sharing rooms and you know and we went through a lot of ordeals like really crazy stuff especially the two months like to this day the two months of traveling between Sudan Eritrea and Ethiopia was the hardest I've ever done it was full-on uh, so yeah so we went to Kenya and we went to this beautiful island called Lamu and it was it was kind of a mutual decision, but it was actually more. I realized that now after going through all my journals and, and doing my podcast and going back in time. Yeah, it was kind of more me that actually said, OK, I think we should go our separate ways. And he was fine with that as well. So I'd met an Australian guy in Lamu and we hit it off really well. And I just decided when Craig left, the Aussie guy, that I was just going to leave with him, which is what I did. Mm. But then Casey and I saw each other again in Nairobi. And I assumed we'd bump into each other because we're going the same way, right? So the last time I've seen Casey was, I think it was in July 93 in Nairobi. That's the last time I've seen him. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Because I basically moved to England from Africa. And I lived in England for over 20 years. And he's now in Oakland, California. So, Yeah. But Crazy. we have been in touch recently via email, and he's loving the podcast, actually. So he's like, this is great. It's, it's bringing back so many memories. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> you went your separate ways in Kenya, and you eventually ended up in South Africa. Did you end up going straight down on your own from South Africa? No. And also, just to finish with the KC thing, um, after our, we left, like shortly after we left, I found out that he decided to bail on the trip and go to England and move to England for a year. And then he came back, like, so he flew back from like London to Nairobi and then traveled from Nairobi to Cape Town by land a year later. Now he still thinks that counts. I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Cause even after he had the, Oh, I think he said, no, I was only in England for 11 months. So I'm like, okay, 11 months. But I was still in Africa after he'd been in England for almost a year kind of thing so I'm like no it doesn't count for sure um, so after we did our own went our step ways I traveled with that Aussie guy Craig for about mm. two weeks and then he had met an English girl Claire previously and so I met her in Nairobi and her and I actually we traveled together for about three months so kind of all around let's say Lake Victoria or Central Africa mm -hmm. and then after we departed I was on my own for couple months I think yeah two-ish months and then I met these awesome people in Harare Zimbabwe and Warren had a old like Land Rover and he was one of the only people I met he did what I did but he had a, his own car and he traveled from England down to, to Cape Town as well <laughs> and along his way he picked up a Kiwi guy Oliver and two Australian cousin girls Leona and Lisa so they had been traveling together for a while and then when I met them in Harare I kind of they had a little group meeting and they decided I was cool enough to <laughs> to join their little gang so I, I nicknamed us the Commonwealth group because we had Brit Canadian and Aussies and a Kiwi so uh yeah so which was perfect for me because especially at that time like Zimbabwe and Namibia especially where there was hardly any public transport. Like you really need to have your own vehicle. And I don't 
I still don't have my driver's license. So <laughs> they did, ruled it up for me. So it was perfect timing to meet up with them. And we had a blast. Like we spent Christmas together and, uh, and made it to Cape Town together. It took me almost a year to the day to get to Cape Town. I got there just before New Year's Eve. So I had New Year's Eve 94 in Cape Town, which was really cool. And then once we parted ways, yeah, I, I was on my own the last, so I was 16 months. So yeah, last four months or so, I was on my own to go back up to Nairobi. The the key, Tamara, is that you succeeded in your mission to make it from Paris to Cape Town overland. Yep, I did. And that wasn't even enough for me. I decided I'd hitch back up to Nairobi. So. <laughs> yeah. So let's get to the hitchhiking, Tamara, because this this is super, super intriguing to me. Now, we're talking 90s. So Africa was a very different place in the 90s, as was a lot of other countries in the world too. But you were in Durban, is that correct, when you started this hitchhiking mission all the way up the eastern side of southern Africa to Kenya. Why, I guess is the question, why the hell did you think it was an, uh, a cool idea to go hitchhiking from South Africa to Kenya? I, I, I mean, I had done some hitching along the way down, like, because... Yeah, Claire and I had to hitch. It took us five days to just travel 500 kilometers like, in central Uganda. <laughs> so like, it was like, this is ridiculous. So I did do some hitching, but the, yeah, the biggest hitching was definitely from Durban. Basically, I had a great, great uncle who lived in Durban, who I never met. Um, he was an ex-British naval commander. So he was like my grandma's uncle. <laughs> yeah. And so he was my great, great uncle, although I was forbidden to ever call him that in public, obviously. So my grandma, because remember, again, no internet, no emails. So my grandma had written him a letter and just saying, listen, my granddaughter's in Africa. Would you like to meet her? And he was like, yes, for sure. You know, he hadn't seen any of his family for like, because he'd been in Africa, South Africa for I don't know, 20 years, I think, when, by the time I got there. He's called Douglas. And... I call him Uncle Dougie. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I stayed with him in Durban and worked. I bartended for about six weeks or so just to save money because I had I was pretty broke. And so I needed money to get back up to Nairobi. My whole reasoning <laughs> to do this was because I had decided I was going to move to England and I kept in touch with my friend Claire and she was graduating university. So she's like, listen, by the time you get here, I'm going to be moving out of home and you know getting my own place so we could get a two-bedroom place if you want to live in Leeds now I didn't never been to England I'm like sure sounds great <laughs> whatever <laughs> so yeah so I decided I'd hitch to Nairobi because the flight would be cheaper for me to book a flight from Nairobi to London than Joburg to London that's the only I reason see. and then it ended up taking me like and I thought I could do it really quickly well it ended up taking me about three months <laughs> <laughs> we, we've spoken before on zoom and you gave me a little bit of a brief up on some of the crazy stuff that went down for you on this trip from durban to nairobi apparently once you got lost in lesotho what was that all about well actually i was in i thought it was lesotho when we talked before but it's actually south africa you got near, lost in South Africa. Yeah, it was very near Lesotho, uh, so still in the in the Drakensberg Mountains. Uh, yeah, so I I hitched up to this uh, chalet, I guess, or I mean, really, it was the park rangers' <laughs> accommodation. I just kind of showed up, and but they rented a couple of rooms there, mm. so I got there kind of er, well early afternoon. So, I, anyways, I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go for a little, you know, little hike couple hours to the base of this one mountain that I could see uh the closer I got I'm like well maybe I'll just climb it <laughs> I'm by myself <laughs> I did like I think I might have I must have mentioned to them I was like I, but I said I'm just gonna go for a little walk I mean you're in the wilderness you're in the mountains so there's not like you I'm going here I I did they did give me a map but it's a map like you know it's a geographical map like it's not really you know yeah, and I just had the, you know, my water, a couple of snacks, not a lot on me. Yeah, so then I decided I was gonna just get to the, yeah, I was just gonna climb this mountain. As I was getting near the top, all of a sudden the weather changed because in the mountains weather changes very fast. Mm. 
Mm. And this fog descended. Like I, I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. And I'm like, oh my God, like I can't see anything. And I'm on like literally goat trails, right? <laughs> and at one point I'm on this trail and I'm hugging the mountain. So I'm like brushing against the mountain and I'm just following this trail. The fog cleared for about a second. I looked down and it's a sheer, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 meter drop. And I'm on this mountain, or this path that's about two feet wide. And then the fog comes down again. And so I can't see. <laughs> I know now that if I, you know, literally move half a step to yeah to my left, I'm going to die basically. <laughs> so I was a little freaked out. But anyways, I just kind of followed and got to the top, but being so disoriented and with the fog, I came down the wrong side of the mountain. Mm. And I'm like, okay, what the hell? This doesn't really look familiar. <laughs> So what do I do? I climb another mountain. <laughs> and then I go down that mountain and then I come to a river. <laughs> like, okay, this is, this isn't great <laughs> at all. I mean, this river was pretty small, but, and I can't see anything. Like there's no houses, nothing. Like it's just wilderness and mountains. I came to a little bit of a forest, very small, little well, it wasn't a clearing. It, it, there was trees. So, and then it, it got dark. And, uh, and in mm. Africa, when the sun goes down, it's dark. It's not like you have dusk for ages. It's just, it's like the light switches off almost. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like, well, if I have some, some trees, at least that's a little bit of protection. Cause then it was like drizzling. It was raining too. So <laughs> I was like, great. And I just had like a pair of thin trousers on. And I think I had my rain jacket on, but I had no supply. Like I, <laughs> this wasn't planned. So, and it get, gets quite cold too. And I was just, I didn't know what to do. And of course, animals, like <laughs> there's yeah. animals. I, I mean, you know, I don't know what animals are there, but there's animals out there for sure. I was managed. Luckily I had some matches in my little day bag. So I did, but the, the wood was really wet. So I did manage to find a few like little branches. I did manage to get a fire going somehow. And like I said, I had some nuts and I had a bit of water, but that was one of the only times I did actually cry on this trip because <laughs> I just thought, what? It, well, first of all, I was just so annoyed at myself for being so stupid for doing this in the first place. I should just have done like walk to the base of the mountain and came back like, but I'm an idiot. So wasn't expecting the fog, obviously. Mm. So I kind of got myself together and I was like, okay, well, I got to figure this out, basically. <laughs> I don't know how, but so I obviously didn't really sleep much because I'm scared of the animals, really. Uh, and it wasn't very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the sun came up, I was like, okay, let's get this shit done. <laughs> <laughs> So I came to another, a bigger river. So I had to cross that. And then I'm just walking and, you know, the map is useless to me because I don't, I don't know where I am. So, and then all of a sudden I hear bells and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. The cow, they're cowbell. I'm, where's there's cows, there's got to be an owner of those cows. <laughs> so I literally just followed cowbells till I found the cows and found the owner who was this lovely man, he spoke no English at all, local man. And he had a little daughter with him. She was maybe I don't know, six or seven. And, you know, through miming, I kind of was like, I'm super lost. And, and he was like, have you eaten? You know, and I was like, no, not really. Anyway, bless him. He literally just milked a cow in a glass bottle and gave it to me to drink. Wow. It was very, very lovely, but does not taste good at all. Let me tell you, warm, unfiltered milk. Blah. But it was, I was dehydrated. So I drank some. And anyways, he kind of figured out where, because of the, the only place I could be staying was at the Rangers Park accommodation kind of thing. So I got the map out and he showed me where I was and how to get back. But then he sent his little daughter with me to take me because there was a shepherd's path, which I missed completely. Like I said, mm. I was falling literally goat trails so bless her so yeah she crossed the river with me and she took me to the base of the second mountain kind of just said just you know stay on this path that will take you to the the, the rangers park thing 
So I'm like, okay. So yeah, so I had to climb two more mountains. <laughs> track. Finally, finally made it back to my the comedy the Parker's place, Park Ranger's place, like almost before, you know, probably around four or five PM. So I had been gone for yeah, 28 hours, something like that. Mm. I got back exhausted, like so happy. And they were like, oh, we're just about to send out the helicopter for rescue. I'm like, are you kidding me? I could have just stayed put and you would have found me in a chopper. <laughs> that would have been so much easier. <laughs> but yeah, so I made it back in one piece. Uh, but yeah, never again. Don't be stupid like me and, and do things like that. <laughs> wow. The people at the ranger's hut knew you were there. I guess you had a lot of your possessions there while you were walking and they were actually worried that you had really something serious that happened to you lost out on the mountains. Oh yeah. Like my main backpack and everything was there. And I, like, I just arrived and I maybe mm. had a cup of tea or something like that. And I thought, Oh, I want to get a hike in before it gets dark. So I didn't even tell them where I was going. I just said, I'm going out for a walk. That, that's it. A long walk. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the only one there, like wow. the only traveler there too. So it wasn't like, like, you know, they they would have missed me, basically. Yeah, it was crazy. It was one of the huh. craziest things I've done, for sure. Now, at the moment, with the pandemic going on, there's an incredible amount of nostalgia going on on television, on Netflix, and all the movies and things. One particular movie that's quite nostalgic is Pretty Woman. I remember watching that as a kid. There's a story where you almost became the pretty Swaziland woman. Is that correct? Mm hmm So... After that ordeal, I, I, I hitched in Lesotho to, uh, to Joburg, and then I hitched from Joburg into Swaziland, which isn't even called Swaziland anymore. So I had to, on my way down from one of my favorite names, Pig's Peak, Swaziland, nice. <laughs> to the capital, which is uh, in Babon. I, yeah, I met this this lovely, you know, middle-aged man who, who picked up pitching and he basically gave me his house like, to stay there because his wife was in the hospital in Pigs Peak. So he was kind of staying there and coming back and forth. So I was like, great. So yeah, I gave me keys to his house. I'm like, all right. Cause I had to apply for my Mozambique visa. So I had to kind of go up and down a few times. So I had this house already and then I was hitching back for, I'd already gone back up to Pigs Peak and I was hitching on my way down again. And this, like, Mercedes stops. I mean, these roads are, like, dirt roads, basically, right? And I'm like, oh, sweet, rad. <laughs> so he pulls over, and I get in the car with him, and we start chatting. That's one thing, mostly. I was only ever picked up by men hitching, and usually the first thing they would say to me, if they could speak English, was, are you crazy? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, so I got quite used to that. Uh, yeah, so we started talking and he, I won't say the company, but he was, well, he said he was the owner. I'm not sure if he was or not, but he was very wealthy. But he said he was the owner of this big donut franchise, like international franchise. And he was there. He's like, I needed a break from the States. So I came here to open up a, a franchise here in South Africa or in Swaziland just to get away from my ex-wife <laughs> really and two kids. So I was like, okay. We got back to Emma Bond Swaziland. And he's like, well, why don't you come back to my hotel, which was the nicest hotel in the capital, but it was more like a, a motel to be honest, but it was still nice. So we had a pool and everything. So yeah. So I went back with him to his place. Remember I've got the keys to this other guy's house. Too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so we ended up chatting for, for quite a while. And then he was like, well, what, what are you, you know, what are you doing the next day? I'm like, oh, well, no, I'm waiting for my Mozambique visa. So I've got really nothing to do for the next few days. So basically we hung out together for a few days. And then at the end of one of the days, he said to me, you know, cause he said, you know, he was, he was a multimillionaire and he owned wineries and, you know, he gave me his card and everything like that. So I did believe him. And he was like, well, listen, I'm in, I'm in Switzerland for two more weeks. So what would it take for you to stay with me for these two weeks? And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, listen, I'll write you a check for whatever amount you want, really. Reasonable, I guess. Um, 
for you to stay with me. I'm like, well, what do you mean like stay? He's like, well, like in every which way. I was like, what, like sleep with you? He's like, yeah. I'm like, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> So I kind of like, okay, I did think about it for like 10 minutes, but he was like this little Jewish guy, like who was about 50, uh, late 50s. I'm, you know, 23. I got along with him really well, but there, I didn't fancy him at all. <laughs> but then I really had no money either. So it was like, mm. yeah, I just thought, you know what? I'm not for sale for any price. So I just said to him, I was like, listen, his name is Peter. I was like, Peter you know what, you need a friend more than anything. And I'll do that for free. And I'll stay with you. We'll hang out for the next few days while I'm here. But I just can't do that, really. He actually started crying. And he went, wow, I can't believe that. Like, thank you. He goes, it's so lonely. When you're rich, he goes, it's a very lonely world, because you always you don't know why people are being nice to you, what they want out of you. It's very hard to trust people. He goes, even my ex-wife and my two sons are waiting for me to die to take my money. Like, they don't give a shit about me kind of thing. So hmm. for you to do that, and I know that you have hardly any money, you know, and um, he goes, that means a lot to me. And he, he gave me his card and he's like, if you ever need anything at any time, anywhere, you call me kind of thing. I was like, okay, that's cool. I mean, yeah, like he did, like when I was ever at the motel with him, like the staff knew, like it was all on his tab. He did take me to a casino in South Africa and gave me money to gamble and, you know, bought dinners for me and stuff like that. And then, but when we were at the motel at about six o'clock, seven o'clock, you know, to be knock on the door <laughs> should be his prostitute and uh, i would let her in and i'd say see you tomorrow <laughs> oh wow so it worked out fine <laughs> <laughs> and he actually drove me to the border to the mozambique border was and and he drove me up to get pick up my visa so uh, and then when i left he drove me to the border so yeah i mean he was he was awesome and the funniest thing so this was in 94 mm. in 98 I did my second big trip and that was from Amsterdam to Kathmandu by land by myself. And when I was in Czech Republic, I was in this little Irish bar in, I think it was called Brno, Brno, B-R-N-O. Brno, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I never did. Uh, yeah, there's an Irish bar in there and I was supposed to leave the next day. I, I was like, well, it's an Irish pub. That'd be rude not to go into. <laughs> so, uh-huh. so I went in there, plopped down next to this guy, ended up chatting to, he was Irish, I ended up chatting to him. Well, he was the owner of the pub. Nice. And again, yeah, again, so I had my drinks bought all night for me. <laughs> but we started <laughs> chatting and I was telling him this story. And he's like, I know Peter. Peter's a good friend of mine. I'm like, shut up. He's like, he was just here. He what? was here like two weeks ago. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's so crazy. I was like, well, make sure you say hi. You know, say from tomorrow, Swaziland, he'll know who it is. Mm. But yeah, how crazy is that, eh? Small world. Super small world. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, in his Mercedes, I imagine, drove you up to the Mozambique border. There were no issues getting your visa. You just had to wait some time. Were you concerned at all about entering Mozambique and and hitchhiking through Mozambique? And were those concerns things that you should have been worried about? Or were there other things that, you know, happened to you that you could never have foreseen? Well... I really wasn't worried about going anywhere because I, I like I'd come down through all of Africa. So that built a lot of confidence in me. I mean, I, and I have very good gut instincts. Like I'm not really not like, yeah, the, the mountain thing was stupid, but I'm not normally stupid. <laughs> and I have very good gut instincts about people and places and things. So that's one thing I say about traveling, like listen to your gut always. It's always right. Yeah. So I wasn't concerned, but I was concerned <laughs> once I got to the border because so yeah, Mozambique had been in a civil war for I think 33 years and it had literally just opened up like f- for a few weeks. Like, it hadn't been open very long. So as I walked across the border, you know, wave bye to Pete, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the custom guys were like, uh, Madam, where's your car? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm hitching. You know, I'm, my house is on my back. You know, I, I, it's okay. And they're like, just look at me like, you are nuts. Like what? And they're like, well, madam, please, please don't put your house, like my tent, anywhere off the 
And there's really only, well, I think probably still now, one road, one main road, which goes up along the whole coast, like 1,200 kilometers or whatever. Yeah, so don't put your house more than maybe 200 meters on either side, but stay on the beach side probably from the road. I was like, well, why is that? They're like, well, there's like over a million landmines at least still in the ground unexploded. I'm like, whoa. Okay, well, that's the best tip I have ever still received. <laughs> like, good to know. <laughs> sad, very sad to hear, but good to know. So yeah, so then I was a little obviously concerned. <laughs> No doubt. Yeah. But, and they also said, like, I was one of the first, if not the first, non African person to have come into Mozambique, especially walk across the border uh, for, yeah, 33 years, whatever it been, besides like VSO workers and mm -hmm. aid workers and stuff like that. But so, yeah, so in Mozambique, the only people I, I did meet were uh, pretty much South Africans. Now, there was a moment on your road trip hitchhiking through where you feared for your life. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I was, like I said, Mozambique, it was, it was very weird, but like, um, I guess bittersweet vibe because the country was destroyed. I mean, 33 years of war. So every city town, you could see bombing, you know, buildings you know, that were that had been bombed and things like that and like i said this one road had potholes the size of trucks and like just the road was trashed mm. and then you also saw a lot of people including children you know missing limbs because of these damn land landmines but they were super happy the war was over so it was a very bitter sweet experience and and all the locals and they speak portuguese as well so not that i do but you know, all the locals I met were super smiley, happy, just sweet, sweetest people kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, so I was hit. I was probably about a third of the way up Mozambique, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And I was, yeah, hitching. And I'd been at this place for for hours. Like I was waiting for hours, which usually was it like I usually got picked up pretty quickly. But this time, yeah, hours. And at this point, by this time, like I had all these kids sitting around me. <laughs> Because, you know, they didn't see many travel, like Westerners kind of thing, right? Mm. Which was, that kind of happened all throughout Africa, really. But yeah, so I had all these kids and I'm like, okay, great. I'm really, it's going to be more difficult. <laughs> Are they coming with you? Like kitchen kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, so, and I was kind of on a corner bend and this pickup truck is just way like speeding along. And like I said, the roads are really bad. So you shouldn't really drive that fast. Whizzing by me. And then they slam on the brakes about a hundred meters away from me and then reverse as in like Duke's a hazard. Like, you know, just like, <laughs> and then pull over and like, kind of like get in. I'm like, Oh my God. This was one of those moments when you're like, uh, what do I do? And there was no, I wasn't near any towns or anything like that. So it's like, I pitch my tent at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere or I get in the back of this pickup truck, which looks like it's being driven by the Mozambique Cheech and Chong. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I love Cheech and Chong. They just looked a little dodgy, basically. But I was like, okay, well, let's just go for it. Because it was the back of the pickup. So I was like, okay, I, let's go for it, I guess. So I jump in the back of the pickup and they just take off, like, you know, super fast. And but then every 40, 45, 45 minutes or so, they'd stop. I was like, what the hell? And you know, and I'm in the back, it's super hot, sunny. You know, they're just off the side of the road, so there's no shade or anything like that. And I'm like, okay, what? And then I look, and they're like smoking crack or something. Well, crack didn't exist back then, but I don't know, they were smoking some something mm. like through a pipe, not like a joint. And I was like, okay, this is great. <laughs> And they're driving like no wonder they're driving like crazy <laughs> so the next time they stop i kind of you know they have the, the window in the back so i knocked on the window and they opened it and they're like they were super smiley like chill whatever and i'm like hey guys just want to you know next time you stop do you think you could stop under some shade and i'm like yeah okay no problem man <laughs> so i'm like okay so they smoked again and then we went and then all of a sudden 
you know, another 45 minutes later, like they slam on the brakes, reverse. Like I didn't even see this path because it's so it's very Mozambique coastline is very jungly. Like it's very, very lush vegetation and very green. It's very beautiful. But anyway, so they were, and then they just start driving into the jungle. I'm like, what the hell? Oh my gosh, here we go. I'm about to be killed. <laughs> so I'm thinking, and yeah, they keep driving in the jungle. I, I'm like, I, like, how did they even know this path was here? Like you could not see it if, unless you knew it was there. So I'm in, like, I'm in flight mode. Well, fight and flight mode kind of thing. So I'm like, okay, my uncle, before I left, he gave me a six inch blade bone handle knife for Africa. So I had that like almost in my hand, like I had a, like my, in my day back. So it was on the top of my day back. I've got my money belt with my passport, my money and everything. I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have to leave my backpack because I got to run through this jungle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm ready to go. I'm fine with that. I'm like, just, you just got to live. So they finally stop under this huge tree and I'm like, I'm ready to go. Right. <laughs> he opens the window. He goes, is this enough shade for you? <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> and that was it. They just found me shade. And then he turns around, and he's like, and he passes me this big doobie, big giant. He's like, Do you smoke? I'm like, Yeah. And he goes, Here you go. And that was it. <laughs> so, yeah, sparked up, chilled out. We left and they actually took me to where I wanted to be dropped off. So I was with them for most of the day. And they even took me to a restaurant and bought dinner for me. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking they're about to rape and kill me. <laughs> they were. They turned out to be Cheech and Chong, and they told me they're on this. The they had to get to. I think they're going to Malawi, but they only had like 20 hours. I don't know they had a really short time, and that's why they were driving so fast and everything. Because mm. they had to get to Malawi for something or other uh, by a certain time. So yeah, it worked out well like I said I really thought I was a goner but um so your your heart stopped momentarily when they were banging through the jungle on a route that you were not familiar with and even not expecting and at the end they just wanted to find you some nice shade and I imagine after you'd smoked the joint with them the rest of the ride was a lot more relaxing <laughs> totally I was super chill <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that was like i honestly i i had it all planned eh? like i was gonna stab them like if i had to you know what I mean? like self-defense yeah, yeah. obviously but my main thing was just run as soon as the yeah. trucks like run leave your backpack just run <laughs> luckily didn't have to do that it, yeah. it was crazy and that was another time i got picked up by these two burly i think they were cops or ex-cops or something like these huge huge south african dudes and they had a nice car and they picked me up. I can't remember where I was even. They were like, well, where are you staying? I'm like, oh, I'm just going to like pitch my tent in the, <laughs> which I have done in a police station front yard. <laughs> like, I've, I've done that one before. <laughs> and they're like, what? No, you're not. Listen, we're on business. So we have two hotel rooms. So we'll give you one of the hotel rooms. And I'm like, what? And a nice hotel. Like I was staying in like dive Ivy guest houses or or yeah there wasn't really many hostels back then so these two big burly bearded dudes shared a bed <laughs> in a room to give me the other room for free like yeah just super Gentleman. nice yeah <laughs> so yeah it did work out like i said i was offered you know houses and all sorts so these crazy stoner uh hooning duke of hazards type blokes were on their way to Malawi, as were you. But what I'm curious about is I've heard before that some people call Malawi, Malawia. Why do they do that? Yeah, I call it that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I'd come through Malawi on my way down. So from Mozambique, mm -hmm. I was I went back through Malawi. Uh, well, the reason why is because everyone, could, well, not everyone, but most people who get malaria, they get it in Malawi. So that's why it's like, well, it should be called Malawi. <laughs> so that's why I call it that. <laughs> After you went through uh, Mozambique, Malawi, you had to go through Tanzania before you got to Kenya and Nairobi, which was your goal. Were there any interesting things that happened to you on that leg of the hitchhiking journey? No, because again, I, I'd come through Tanzania like I spent a lot more time in Tanzania and Malawi on my way down. 
Mm. Yes, they were, you know, not too bad, really. Like Malawi, I stayed in Nakata Bay for a couple of weeks on my way down. So I knew that place really well. And also when I was in Blantyre, Malawi, where I got malaria, which is not <laughs> recommended by, at all. And I think I also got malaria again in Mozambique at the end of Mozambique as well. So, cause I wanted to go all the way up the coastline of Mozambique and Tanzania into Kenya that way, which was extremely, extremely difficult. Probably even now, but back then for sure, there was just no public transport, you know, it was really hard. But because I got malaria just before I was about to do that, I was like, I, I just can't do more really hard traveling. So I'll, yeah. I cut back into Malawi because, like I said, I, I knew people there and I, I knew it well. So, so yeah, it was okay. Tanzania, I kind of just pretty much went straight through it on my way up. Uh, I did meet a couple of travelers in Malawi and we like got buses together. Buses and hitching. I think I hitched by myself, but I met some people. Like I took some buses as well to mm. in Tanzania to get to Kenya. And Nairobi, I knew very well. Nairobi is like my my second home in Africa really because <laughs> I probably spent well on my way down I spent probably about like three weeks in Nairobi or something like that in total so I knew Nairobi really well and where I stayed in Nairobi again if you asked any local Nairobi people what area to avoid that's where I stayed <laughs> you're so that's, crazy <laughs> that's well that's where the um I'm trying to think of the road but there was one main road where all the the cheap guest houses and restaurants and stuff were right mm. so that's why it's bad because thieves and robbers or whatever they knew that's where all the westerners were so that's probably it kind of went uh, hand in hand yeah. i mean luckily i didn't have anything major happen to me there but i met several people uh, and more even more people that knew people that like when they fly into nairobi like you know start of their african trip they're super excited <laughs> And then they get, walk down this road and they've been like mugged in broad daylight with the knife to their throat. They're like, they take their whole backpack, their money belt, like take everything from them and then leave. Mm. It's like, That's welcome nice. to Africa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like I said, I personally met several people that happened to you and you met many more that met other people that happened to you so luckily I was okay there and I actually really liked Nairobi because coming down like the Sudan Eritrea and Ethiopia Nairobi was amazing because they had food there was lots of great great cheap food and for two months we didn't really eat too much really. When you arrived in Nairobi after this hitchhiking trip that took you all the way up from Durban what did you feel like did you have like this this sense of achievement or this this sense of relief or were you just ready to sort of go on your next part of your traveling journey and head up into Europe oh yeah I was very relieved to be still alive <laughs> for sure because <laughs> I had quite a few near-death experiences like a truck accident in Ethiopia and like lots of other different things and just like random things you know I used to ride in the back of trucks a lot so mm. one accident you're gone so yeah, I had a huge sense of relief that I was still alive for sure. And that I did it and I did it more. I did more than I planned, you know, you know, when I left on this trip, I thought it would be maybe six months to get from Paris to Cape Town. You know, that trip alone was 16 months. And then I moved from Nairobi to England. So I ended up being gone when I thought it was going to be a six month trip turned into 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and it changed my life completely like I got my degree in England like England I'm half English so mm. you know England it will always be a home to me and I lived in Brighton England for 20 years so yeah it completely this trip I mean you know remember my plan was to go to the Caribbean so what would have been my life then like you know how wow. you come to these crossroads and what would have changed like I never in a million years would have thought this African trip would turn into what it has kind of thing right mm. so one thing for sure is if you had have done your yacht hitchhiking, it would have been extremely hard to find shade. <laughs> well, and also I hate wind. So I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I, I have what you call windophobia. So <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what would have happened there. And I hate, so hurricanes, like I would have just had a heart attack. So, <laughs> so I guess it worked out for the best, really. 
and also just to meet my friend Claire, like randomly, you know, it's just how little, little things turn into big things. You know what I mean? Because then mm. I, like I did, I moved to Leeds with Claire and luckily, because I literally had about a hundred pounds in my pocket and I was exhausted. Like by the time I got to England, I'm not sure what they call it, but yeah, I was exhausted. Like I was, and all my clothes were falling to bits, like literally held together by clothespins. So luckily Claire had the money to lend me to, to pay for first a month for, uh, rent for our two bedroom place. And then, you know, I got jobs and everything like that. But then she got into postgrad in Cardiff for journalism so after about six months. So I still owed her some money and she's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I guess we're going to Cardiff. <laughs> <laughs> like I never went she went checked out a place found a, a house and, and two other lovely people that so the former's went to this big beautiful house in Cardiff but yeah I hadn't I didn't go there before I moved there so I just moved to Cardiff and then I was there for about six months paid off the money I owed her became best friends with this Irish girl we're about to move to Dublin although she was from Belfast and she, but she used to live in Brighton and she said oh so she went and her sister still lived there. So she went back to Brighton for a weekend and we were like literally moving to Dublin in a few weeks. And she came back, got me drunk and said, well, Tim, do you mind if we move to Brighton instead of Dublin? I'm like, I don't care. I haven't been to either. It's fine. <laughs> Give me another beer. Yeah. So I ended up moving to Brighton and ended up living in Brighton, like or based in Brighton for yeah 20 years. Well, Tamara, it's clear that this experience going from Paris to Cape Town overland and your experiences in Africa in general set your life on a new path completely with being away from Canada for over two decades. Would you say also as a 23-year-old of which you were at that time, were there any real strong life lessons that that adventure taught you that you still hold true today? Uh, Yeah, for sure. Like, probably what it taught me was patience because <laughs> you gotta have patience mm. especially in well and anywhere but especially yeah traveling in an Africa and places like that yeah it definitely in like gave me a lot of confidence to be able because I also have a, a rare blood illness so I have a chronic illness which affects me quite badly with um, pain and inflammation and it's mm. almost killed me three times with septicemia because I get really crazy abscesses you know I've been hospitalized many times you know so taught me you know I can do what I want to do if I set my mind to it and if I do have like when I do get sick or you know you just especially when you're on the road you just stop and rest and local people and that's why I I often tend to stay in local guest houses and things like that like small places is because you just get more of a feel of being in that place and you're also helping you know you're giving money to local people which is great but I've always always like when I had malaria when I, I've had dysentery I've had dirty I've had so many tropical illnesses on top of mine which makes then my illness worse so it's like a double whammy kind of thing mm-hmm. but I've always been looked after by local people or other travelers yeah if anyone is worried about traveling who has a disability or chronic illness then yeah you can do it. I mean, you're going to be sick wherever you are in the world. You might as well be sick somewhere that you would love to be, like on a, on a mountain or on a beach or jungle or whatever, you know. So don't let that stop you. So, yeah, so instill my confidence in, for sure. And like I said, gut instinct, that really yeah. kicked in for sure. Is like, do you listen to your gut? Because it is always right. Yeah, you, you mentioned on your website that what you're all about is promoting solo travel specifically female solo travel traveling with disabilities of all varieties slow travel and ethical travel these are your your sort of mantras when it comes to traveling and there's more information about that and about you on your website too aren't isn't there in um, manyroadstravel.com with two l's not one l well yeah Yeah. that's it like even you know that was my first trip but even since then like i've done other like i said the you know the amsterdam to Kathmandu. that was almost a year Mm -hmm. I've done, you know, gone around Southeast Asia twice for five months at a time. But my most recent trip, which I was lucky to get in, which is February 2020. So just I got home two weeks before the lockdown. So, yeah, so I spent a month in Central America, you know, and I just turned 50. So I did that trip. 
Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of crazy things on that trip too. <laughs> I mean, my body is not. <laughs> Some up people to it. never change. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I went, I climbed a volcano, an active volcano, and it's the only place in the world you can go volcano boarding. Like you, you board down this active volcano. It's crazy. What country is this? That was in uh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua, cool. Yeah. So yeah, so I did six countries in a month, which is way too fast for me, but still by land. And that's one thing. I mean, I don't think traveling is ever going to go back, to be honest, before COVID. Because, and also climate change, right? And that's the thing. I get really annoyed when I see people fly like a short distance. Like, why don't you take a bus or a train when there is that option there? Or many buses or whatever, you know, like, first Mm -hmm. of all, you're going to, you get much more of a sense of accomplishment when you do slow traveling and you get second you get like a feel of the place much better as well especially if you're using local transport you meet local people you get you just get more into it and like I don't know how many bus journeys I've been on that you know they stop and and people come on with selling all their the food they've made and stuff like that so you just get much more of a real sense of being in that place and and that's what traveling is to me. It's not to check off boxes and it's not that about that. It's experience and really feeling for a place, you know, the vibe or the, the feel of a country or a city or wherever you are kind of thing, right? So, yeah, I think people have to <clears throat> change in how they travel as well. Like, there's, it's just ridiculous. And, and that's another thing. Like, with COVID, I mean, so many air airlines have gone out of business already right so you know you know what europe's like all the really cheap flights and i've taken them yeah of course so i don't mind flying to to get to you know the start of my trip and obviously to fly home because i have to (laughs) most of the time but the rest of the time yeah it's all usually by public transport i don't hitch as much as i did back then because i can't defend myself like i did when i was 23 my hands are screwed up so (laughs) right Although I did really want to hitch in, in Central America. I did try a couple of times, but the transport came before I, I got a ride kind of thing. So oh, right. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't fear. I just, I'm not as confident in my self-defense, let's just say, because of my health issues. So I played a little bit more safe these days, I guess. My favorite four. What is your favorite mode of transportation? Oh, there you go. I'd probably say train, actually. What is your favorite foreign word? (laughs) Shiza. What is your favorite backpack? The one I have now? I don't know. So what is my backpack? I don't know. 20 liters? It's pretty small. Small I think it's about 25 liters. And this is going to be uh, maybe a difficult one for you. What is your favorite road trip? Hmm. Yeah, that is a difficult one. And that's what, like, the, my least favorite question is people is, what's your favorite country? I'm like, I don't have one. Like, <laughs> I understand. Um, well, let's just go with the African trip because this is my first. My favorite four. And speaking of that African trip hitchhiking through, and at that time, was there a particular country where the hitchhiking was a lot easier? than another country or smoother or more enjoyable? Well, I mean, countries that had more, you know, like I said, you know, Uganda took us five days, but 500 kilometers because we are in central Uganda. There's just some little Mm. villages, right? So if you're in more habitat, you know, habitat places, more people live, you know, so something like, you know, South Kenya or Tanzania around Dar Samar, like it's, there's more people. So you have more options to travel kind of thing. Mm. I mean, Zaire, which again, it's not called that anymore. It's called the Democratic Republic of Congo, I think now. But yeah, like Zaire was crazy because like we got stopped, but I was still traveling my friend Claire, like by gorilla, like as in not the animal gorillas, <laughs> we did see those, but uh, gorillas like. With- Alicia literally 12 year olds with machine guns and would just stop all transport and make everyone get out. And and there's like 50 of them and holding guns to your head. And it's Mm -hmm. just like, what? (laughs) Luckily we, you know, survived that too. So yeah, I would say more populated places for sure would be easier for hitching in Africa. And you've got hitchhiking experience that dates back three decades. And I'm sure the hitchhiking 
idea perhaps has changed a little bit with time. If anybody's considering doing hitchhiking, not necessarily in Africa, but maybe generally all over the place, do you have any uh, words of advice for people? Well, weirdly, like I've never hitched in North America or Europe. Like <laughs> I prefer third world or on PC term, third world countries because I don't know, fr- locals are friendlier. Like I, I had less fear there than I would. I would never hitch in definitely. Like I, for me personally, I've never hitched in the states, or Canada, or Europe. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I can't really give you any advice on that. If you do that, I mean, there's lots of great people in those countries for sure. But for me, it was more, yeah, like in Pakistan, I hit, like those, I no problem hitching, but in my own countries, uh, like say Britain and Canada, mm. I wouldn't, there's just too many crazy men, <laughs> <laughs> basically. <laughs> Sad to say, but it's true. And on that note, <laughs> well, time's up basically tomorrow. I've really enjoyed our conversation about hitchhiking across Africa and your experiences in that general area. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. And yeah, we'll have to have another chat sometime soon. For sure. (laughs) Thanks for listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond. I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation. And if you would like to listen to other interesting talks on travel, there are more podcasts available. Check them out wherever you get your podcasts. And for updates, just follow me at The Nostalgic V. Don't forget, your journey is special. Own it. I've been Alan Hill. Until next time. Hey guys, if you enjoy listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond, why not support the podcast? If you haven't already, subscribe, and you'll be notified when new apps drop. You can also support the podcast by leaving a rating or a review on your podcast app. Why not share this episode? Tell your friends about it if something resonated with you. Word of mouth is great promotion. If you're into social media, maybe post a screenshot of the episode or upload the link on your profile so your mates can see what interesting content you've been into lately. All your support comes straight back and helps to keep the travel content and nostalgia of this podcast going. Cheers. So don't forget to subscribe.